Hi, so today I'm going to be talking about um, second, the religion in the second half of the Tudor period and this is going to be covering uh, Edward, Mary and Elizabeth and yeah, this is included in the AQA A-level history course. So let's start with Edward. Well, in 1547 he passed quite a few policies. First of all, the royal visitations, which were kind of neutral in, in nature, in which commissioners were sent to examine the state of the clergy and church doctrine and episcopal authority was paused until the visitations ended. Then the Book of Homilies and Paraphrases was published, which, is, which was Protestant in nature. And it were, these were model sermons and summaries of the New Testament that had to be placed in every church. Then the Royal Injunction, um, 1547 to Protestant again, in which the clergy had to preach in English and with an English Bible, and any literature had to be Protestant in nature. And anything was, that was really superstitious, that was removed. Then the Chantries Act uh, was also passed, again, Protestant. Um, and with an act of dissolution, this, uh, which it revived this act of dissolution and removed all prayers for the dead. It didn't remove them, but they were condemned. The Act of, of Six Articles was repealed, uh, which was Protestant, um, which left the church with no official doctrine, really. And also, which was Protestant in nature, and then the Treason Act was repealed, which is kind of neutral, um, in which old heresy and censorship laws were removed, so there was more religious freedom. And then comes 1548. Uh, there were uh, beginning proclamations to dampen Protestant unrest, which were Catholic in nature, surprisingly, in which subs uh, transubstantiation was, was still in place, and it meant that Catholic rights still needed to be adhered to. Um, images were removed from the church, all images, which again, this is Protestant in nature. I was, was saying that there was this proclamation that meant that only authorized clergy could preach, kind of neutral in nature, which stopped many Protestant pastors from actually preaching. Um, also, there was a proclamation saying that there was no preaching until new liturgy, again, neutral in nature, and this was all to try and control the situation. Also, the first, the first prayer book was published, in 1548, Protestant in nature, and this was written by Cranmer, outlining official liturgy. Then comes 1549, was the Act of Uniformity, again, Protestant, which meant that this stated that the Book of Common Prayer was now official liturgy. Some laws against clerical marriage were, uh, were removed, Protestant, um, and this also set up ecclesiastical courts in the king's name. And um, there was also a proclamation issuing the, the destruction of images, again, Protestant in nature, which meant that any remaining images that had not been destroyed had to be destroyed now. Then in 1550, there was a new reformed ordinal, again, neutral in nature, which detailed the ceremony that, that followed when, um, when the clergy was ordained. And then um, the second year, the remo there was official removal of stone altars and uh, these were replaced by wooden ones, again, Protestant in nature, which were less fancy. Then 1551, no major church doctrine was passed, and then 1552, the New Treason Act was passed, Protestant in nature, which was offense to question, it made it an offense to question any royal authority or articles of faith. You couldn't really question anything the king did, really. Then that same year, the Second Book of Common Prayer was passed, Protestant, um, it removed all traces of Catholicism and established the Eucharist. And prayers for the dead and vestments were, were removed, officially, and as well as being condemned from before. Then the Second Act of Uniformity was passed, which enforced the Second Book of Common Prayer, and meant that the clergy and lazy had to attend church, but Protestant in nature, obviously. Then the Black Rubric, rubric uh, Proclamation was passed, which was neutral in nature, which say that kneeling to to receive communion was, was kind of required, but only for the sake of good order, not because of anything else. And then the 42 articles were submitted, again, Protestant in nature, based on Congress ideas. Then in 1553, one final piece of legislation was passed before Edward died, um, which was a short catechism produced, Protestant in nature, which was a manual for teaching the beliefs of the church. So, um, well, what is the impact of this religious change? Well, by 1547, 20% of Londoners allegedly were Protestant. It was most, most Protestant areas were actually in the south rather than spread out. So 
you can't really say that um, England was fully Protestant by this point because in the north they were still very Catholic and this didn't really change until Elizabeth came to the throne with, with Masham still having its root screen by 1598. And the evidence from people's religions really tends to come from wills. So if they left money to the Catholic Church, they tend to be Catholic. And if they left money to the Protestant Church, they really tend to be Protestant. 32% of wills in London were Protestant and 8% were wills in Durham, New York, which are further north. Um, but many people did not leave wills and only really the gentry and upper level social classes actually had something to, live, to leave. And also, local priests wrote the wills for those who were illiterate, so maybe the people thought they were giving money to the Protestant church, when really it was to the Catholic church. So you can't really base, you can't really rely too heavily on these wills. But religious turmoil was really nothing, more, nothing less than a crisis at a parish, parish level. Well, churches weren't really attracting any, any money because they weren't as fun and as elaborate as they once were, so they didn't really attract much people, many people, much more people. Um, altars were taken down. For example, in Suffolk, um, it took seven shillings and one dime for taking down images, and one shilling and two dimes to take down the font and the high altar in Suffolk again. And then whitewashing in Suffolk, this church, um, you had to pay, I mean, it was paid one pound, three, no, one pound, 14 shillings and eight dimes to for the white, whitewashing of, of this one specific church in Suffolk. Once like, this period went on, as Edward's reign uh, passed, there was declining candidates for, for ordination, which meant that the church was lacking in clergymen. Also, the crown began collecting church treasures, but if you were a church, you could just hide them. And then once the country turned back to, to Catholicism, you could just put them back. Also, there was this whole prayer book rebellion in Cornwall and Devon, in which 7,000 armed men went against Edward's religious changes. Between 1547 and 1549, there was a huge increase in the, uh, in the printing of Protestant pamphlets and books. But expenditure of the church did decrease in general from 1540 onwards. So already under uh, Henry VIII, 1540, um, 1540 onwards, the church was kind of pushed aside. Henry, the whole king's great matter had already been pushed aside. That had already happened 10 years before, so he didn't really have to worry that much. Well, in 1550, altars were ordered to be abolished and replaced with communion tables, but only 27% of Suffolk rules were recognizably Protestant. So that is Edward. That is not, not really that much. Then comes Mary. Mary is the shortest one, shortest reign of all Tudor monarchs, and overall the shortest religious doctrine there, there is. 1543 in August, she says that um, she will not force her, her subjects to choose between the Catholic or the Protestant church. So that's kind of neutral in nature. But some members of the Protestant clergy were deprived of their livings that same month. So this is going more towards Catholicism. In September, he, she had Cranmer arrested, Catholic, Catholic leaning um, doctrine, yeah. Um, and had Latimer, Hoper, Ridley and Rogers and other prominent Protestants imprisoned. Again, Catholic in nature. Then in autumn of 1553, well, Parliament really straight up refused to pass the Act of Supremacy, which was Protestant in nature. And then she passes, she did, she did manage to pass the Act of Repeal, which effectively ended all, absolutely everything Edward did, all the Edwardian Reformation. It revived Mass, revived ritual worship and clerical celibacy, and even reaffirmed transubstantiation. So this was quite, quite Catholic, as you can, you can probably tell. Then in December, Mary gave up the title of the Supreme Head of the Church, uh, which was, again, Catholic in nature, and she was no longer Head of the Church of England because she just gave that up. Then, in 1554, in January, she had 800 Protestants exiled. So again, really, really Catholic in nature. In March, royal injunctions um, ordered bishops to suppress heresy, to remove any married clergy, although, I mean, some were, I mean, yeah. Somewhere reinstated later on. 
Um, also, we ordained some clergy that had been um, removed with Edward and restored holidays, processions, ceremonies. Um, in, in Norwich, for example, 243 priests lost their posts, 80 in Bath and Wells, and overall 10 to 25% of the clergy lost their posts because they were married. Although, like I said, some were reinstated after they were, after they were confirmed. And this is all Catholic in nature. Um, Gardner even deprived the bishops of, of Gloucester, or yeah, I think it's Gloucester, uh, Hereford, Lincoln, and Worcester, and the Archbishop of York of their sees. So, mm -hmm. and then in April of 1554, um, Parliament rejected the introduction of the heresy laws, but this was, had to do with Philip of Spain, but agreed when it says that monastic lands were not to be returned to church ownership. And this is kind of neutral in nature. Also in November, um, Cole uh, officially returned to England. The excommunication was lifted and the second act of appeal and did all anti-papal legislation and most of the Henrician Reformation. So Catholic in, in nature. So she ended everything her brother did and everything her father did. Then in 1555, there was the publication of Bon Murray's Book of Homilies. In January, there was, uh, which was Catholic in nature, in January, um, a commission was sent to consider refunding some of the religious houses, again, Catholic in nature. February, uh, John Rogers, a uh, biblical translator, which apparently was a real job, to sit there and translate the Bible. Well, he was burned alive at the stake under the um, heresy laws. This is extreme Catholic in nature. In October, the 16th of October, uh, Ridley and Latimer were burned at the stake in Oxford, really Catholic in nature, and this, these two were two of the three Oxford martyrs. In November, on, on the 12th of November, Gardner died, natural causes, and the 13th of November, Cranmer was officially deprived of the see of um, Canterbury. In December, Paul was named, I mean, this is Catholic, and then in December, Paul was named Archbishop, Catholic in nature, and the London Synod started meeting under the official name of Synod, Catholic in nature. Then comes 1556. In February, the Synod actually issued 12 decrees, which went against abuses like absenteeism, pluralism, simony, heresy, a whole bunch of stuff. And this was, again, Catholic in nature. The, it was um, the free foundation of the Benedictine House at West, Westminster was done, and again, Catholic in nature, and even more and more Protestants were burned at the stake for heresy, again, Catholic in nature. Then in March, on the 21st, Cranmer um, recanted all retractions and was burned at the stake, making him officially the third Oxford martyr. And if you actually go to Oxford, there's a little plaque on the ground where all three Oxford martyrs were, were burned. That same day, Cardinal Poole was deprived of his position as papal legate because he had he got into this huge argument with Pope Paul IV. And this is kind of, kind of you can kind of see it's Protestant in nature, maybe. But then the, the following day, Mary said, mm, it's like that, and named Paul Archbishop of Canterbury, which was Catholic in nature. And then 1557. Well, in June, some small religious houses were founded. Catholic in nature, and Pope was actually recalled to to Rome to answer any to answer to some heresy charges. Mary said, oh, "Oh, you want you want Paul to to go to Rome? Yeah, no, he's not going." And actually got him to stay and reject his replacement as papal legate, which is a role Catholic in nature. Then, 1558 in November, which November was kind of a, a heavy month. On the 10th of November, five Protestants were burned at the stake, and overall, throughout Mary's reign, around just under 300 people were, were killed, um, which was Catholic in nature. Um, then on the 10th of November, Thomas Benham, a uh, returned exile, started um, was ministering to Protestants in, in London, again, Protestants in nature. And then on uh, the 17th of November, Mary and Paul die on the same day. They're, they're therefore ending Mary's religious doctrine because she died. So, what's the religious situation? Well, at the beginning, a return to Catholicism to the old religion was really expected throughout the country, and 
people began returning, returning their churches and, and their services back to Catholicism. London was fully Catholic by August of 1553. Then by 1558, uh, the bulk of the country had actually remained Catholic. Protestants were returning from exile, well, who were returning from exile under Elizabeth, knew this and they knew they had, to, they had work to do, they had to turn the country Protestant. There were, and you can see how, I mean, there were problems returning to Rome. Yeah, Mary did get unexcommunicated, recommunicated, but it was, there was still trouble and, I mean, she did reject the papal luggage, um, Cole did get into arguments with um, the Pope. She was too intent on repressing and on um, passing this counter-reformation. Uh, Mary did keep the Bible in English, but it is believed that if she had reigned for a longer period of time, she would have um, succeeded in actually making England Catholic. Fully Catholic, like no Protestantism at all. Well, we can look at kind of the popular attitudes present at the time, but with, first of all, Perkin Diary. Uh, Perkin Diary. Well, there was no, it was an there was an interest in learning and culture, and it was this diary was a, a essentially a narrative of the Reformation, and opposed opposition to Cornwall. This is um like talking about um the like, Cornwall like the Henrician Reformation. Um, uh, it it opposed a clear dislike of the abolishment of all of religious ornaments in churches, and it managed to survive from Henry the Eighth to Elizabeth the First, and it adapted and and survived. And what's the impact? Well, it did influence your Chris priest, like hundreds, even thousands. So they were even excommunicated. And yes, this was mainly written before Mary came, but it did help influence many under Mary's reign. Um, it helped Catholic priests wear ornaments and it reinstated Latin prayers. Uh, one of them being Te Deum Laudamus in Mary's coronation. It was a first hand account of the information. And it was just evidence of popular Catholic belief. So by 1558, it is widely accepted that England was uh, Catholic. And then there's another, another um, uh, thing called Fox's Book of Martyrs, also know, known as the Marks of the Acts and Monument. This was published in 1563, and it talked about Christian Catholic martyrs mainly. And this is a great polemical account over the, um, detailing the suffering of Protestants under the Catholic Church. It was owned by English Puritans, so um, Protestants, and it was really highly influential, and it was mainly Elizabethan propaganda. This was written under Elizabeth. The impact, it showed how violent and bloody uh, Protestant, like, attacks on Protestants were, and it was used kind of an academic code, and it's mainly the very single influence of English Protestantism, but a detailed accounts mainly on Mary's reign. The Oxford martyrs were really named on in these in this book of uh, of martyrs, um, but you know, that's more Elizabethan propaganda, so you have to be careful with that. And here comes Elizabeth, the the big one of this period, fifteen fifty nine, and this is the Elizabethan settlement. Uh, she passed the Act of Supremacy, which was Protestant in nature. In this, she restored royal supremacy in the church rejected papal supremacy, and restored um, most of Reformation, re Reformation legislation. She repealed all heresy laws and revived the royal visitation of the church. Um, she made other clergymen take a note of supremacy and established the queen as official supreme governor. That same year, she also passed the Act of, of Uniformity, which was kind of neutral in nature, actually, rather than um, partisan. Well, she specified the use of a Book of Common Prayer, which was a um, modified version of Primer's. Fun fact, this is the book, same Book of Common Prayer and same Act of Uniformity, which it did, um, it was kind of altered a bit later on, but it's the basis of England's religion to this day. Well, there was no variations in Eucharist belief, these were possible, and this, the black rubric thing that I mentioned in Edward, this was, um, omitted in the Act of Uniformity. And the ornaments used were those before the Act of Uniformity of 1549, so not fully, fully Protestant. And it's all because Elizabeth favored Swinglianism. Swinglianism. 
Then she also passed royal injunctions that same year, which were Protestant in nature. Well, it was these were instructions about the conduct of the church issued in the Queen's name. Well, it was a uh, suppression of Catholic practices. Um, the Eucharist would have to be served at a simple communion table. Anything, anything superstitious were removed. Um, pilgrimages were attacked. Traditional, basically traditional uh, Catholic practices. Well, um, if you were a parish church, you need an English Bible. Mary had most of the country have an English Bible, but again, you, you needed to have an English Bible. If the visitors had to enforce Protestantism, and um, if you had, if you, if you had, um, you're a woman and you married a pastor, you need to have permission. You were allowed to marry a pastor. If you were a pastor, you were allowed to marry, but the woman needed permission from the queen, not the queen herself, but her representatives. Then she also passed the Act of Exchange, which was Protestant. It meant that the queen could use the revenues of diocese if there was a vacancy for a bishop. So if there was a bishop there, she could take the money for herself. And then the bishop could actually pay to actually um, get appointed. In 1563, she also passed the famous 39 Articles, which were mutual in nature. Um, it defined the differences between the Church of England and the Catholic Church, but was uh, relatively unsuccessful in achieving any wider aim. So what is the significance of this settlement? Well, a traditional view is that Elizabeth was, was pushed into more Protestant settlement than she wished for by this Puritan choir in the House of Commons. She really wanted to, it to be more, more Catholic, but this was because of the international situation, but because she faced too much opposition by this Protestant choir, she was forced to back down. Then is the, the revisionist view. There was no, if you will now believe there was no real Puritan choir in the House of Commons. There were just a few of 25 exiles. Only four of them can be redeemed as radical persons. And there wasn't really enough of them to really cause a problem because they lacked any real leadership. They didn't have a strong leader who could like, push their points across and voice their opposition. And if any of the houses really caused a problem, it wasn't the House of Commons, it was the House of Lords, which was made up by a large proportion of Catholic lords and bishops. They refused bills by as few as two votes. Imagine just not having a bill passed because two people said no. Um, Elizabeth actually had to remove people from their posts and arrest key bishops to push her bills through. She even tried to pass two bills in the first years of her reign, the first year of her reign, so 1559, um, but they weren't really accepted because they were too Protestant. The settlement was overall entirely Elizabeth. She really did defend it constantly up until she died, until the end of her reign in 1603, and it um, the, remains the base of the church today. She regarded the church as Erastian, main, basically meaning that it was another yet another branch of government and she refused to let anybody else dictate what should happen to the church. She was really strong-willed and determined not to really be pushed around because she was just a woman. Because back then, a woman was like, oh, she's weak, and Elizabeth's like, no, I'm not weak. So what are the challenges to the religious settlement? So first of all, the aftermath of the religious settlement. Well, we have first the dual psychology which was to justify the Church of England, and it was asserting that it was returning to its true position, abandoned by the Roman Catholic Church many, many centuries earlier. Um, it established an essential uh, continuity between the early Church and the beliefs of the Reformers, and Jules, he, he was uh, an exile during Mary's reign and was a Puritan. Then have the Convocation of 1563, which was a meeting of the two provinces of the English Church, uh, York and Canterbury, um, at the same time as the 1563 Parliament, which um, ended up passing um, the, the 39 Articles. Also, um, the leaders of the Church assumed that this would enable them to complete the reform of the Church that they believed Elizabeth started in 1559, so they believed even more reform would, would take place. There's really little argument to the fact that even moderate bishops, including Parker, had assumed for the um, reform to, to take place. So, like, did people want more reform? Did people want less reform? Not less, but 
Was it enough? Did they want more? I mean, this does suggest people wanted more, but there's not that hard evidence saying that people really wanted more. So what were the requirements made by uh, the convocation? Well, a projection of a certain, and I quote, certain uh, form of doctrine to be conceived in articles was supported by a catechism and the publication of Joel's Apology, which I mentioned um, earlier. Even more, they wanted more reforms to the Book of Common Prayer, essentially the removal of anything popish. They wanted better church laws, discipline, and education, mainly like also talking about the vestiarian controversy because with vestments, that was a whole, whole deal. Also, they wanted to reform church, uh, church's finances to improve the financial situation, not of the bishops, of like the high-ranking people in the church, but of poor clergymen who just needed to get through the day. But really little was done. And the issue with 39 articles, although it was passed in 1563, it wasn't really given any um, legal force until 1571, which was after excommunication. The church really was, was kind of drifting and many leaders wanted a structure and reformed church. It was not the view shared by Elizabeth herself. She was happy with the 1559 settlement and really did not want to change it. She was like fine with what it was. And in official doctrine, the church kind of became Calvinist and it was half reformed in the structure. So what was the church by 1563? Well, the 1563 royal supremacy had actually been restored in England and in the church. There was kind of a certain degree of stability within the church. Also, there was no further reform major reforms from 1563 onwards. So that was kind of stable. The queen had gotten the settlement she wanted in 1563. She was happy with what she had. She didn't ask for anything else. That is it. She all, all was well in her eyes. Um, there was mistrust among the upper clergy regarding this half-reformed nature of the church. The Catholics, they did not really face open persecution like Parsons had under Mary. Well, they had this witness of a very rapid erosion of their faith and the public practice of, practice of this. I mean, the queen just, she just viewed the settlement as final and complete, so she was going to be gone on accommodate for any Catholics or even any Protestants. Her ministers and clergy saw it as a stepping stone into a full-scale reform. So this actually ended up stem creating Puritanism, which was huge under the Stuarts, not right now, but later on in the next dynasty. But yeah, her, her ministers wanted more, she was happy, and if I told you that, that that's what happened, there wasn't any major reform after this, so you can kind of see that Elizabeth won with this. There was the tension created between these two views, which led to clergymen um, who just did not like the settlement, well, just ignoring it, just plainly ignoring it. Um, well, reformist clergy refused to, to wear the, the vestments. Well, the bishops who shared their views and just said, yeah, we're not gonna really enforce the, the settlement. And it collided with Parker, um, who was a Queen's man and was aware of her irritation at this like plain, based in disregard of the rules. Well, he issued his advertisements and detailed the correct dress for the, for the clergy. And it called, he actually called clergy to a meeting and put on a fashion show of the correct dress, which I really don't, I, it didn't happen at all like this, but this is how I like to imagine them. Just imagine one of these runways and like Elizabeth watching at the end and the clergy just like walking through with their robes and stuff. Which I kind of think it's kind of funny. Well, yeah. Um, well, the clergy were asked if they would support or reject these um, these assessments, and we're like, oh, no worry, guys, you can support it or reject it. Don't, no, no, no worries. So some said they supported it, and others rejected it. And those who rejected it then were told, oh, remember how we said no worries? Yeah, no. Um, you are going to be uh, removed from your post, of which these actually included thirty-seven London clergymen. The whole business really had wider implications because it showed the extent as to which the Queen was prepared to enforce her, her settlement. And it did show the divide between, between Protestants. It wasn't just Catholic and Protestants, between Protestants themselves, there was quite a huge divide. Um, those who were, it was like, those who were willing to accept things as a diaphora and 
those who weren't explained like that, there was really clear tension in between those who were more concerned with the tier and trivial supremacy and those who were more concerned with like dealing with what they believe. Um, it showed that the queen could not really impose her authority everywhere. And like, yeah, some of these were fired, but those who were fired were protected by the nobles and the gentry where, where, where they went, who ensured they found a place to work outside of the church. They also had the private clergy, um, like those who were deprived of the they sought support uh, from the leading Protestant theologians on the continent. Um, but some refused to support them because they did believe that they were putting the reform of England at risk. Because if they took too many Protestants in, Elizabeth could just one day wake up and say, Hey, you know how you, you Protestants have been really annoying? Well, now I'm going to make the country Catholic just to mess with you. So they didn't want to risk, risk this, so um, they really didn't. Like, they didn't really support that many of the deprived clergy, clergy. Well, and this bestiary controversy just shows how a uh, petty dispute um, could solve the cracks and um, problems within the Church of England. It just showed the divide even within the Protestants, and it really highlights the Queen's... It's my authority, it's my settlement, I want to make sure it's like this. Well, Catholics and the settlement. Well, Catholicism really remained strong in England for a number of years after um, Elizabeth's settlement. Like I mentioned before, the last root queen in Masham was, was there up until 1598. Just, you know, um, eight years before, no, eight, not even eight years, not less. Um, five years. <laughs> five years before Elizabeth died. It was really influential in the north, particularly in Durham and Lancashire. And well, when Elizabeth actually came to the throne, it wasn't really clear if she would just ban Catholicism or just let it sit there. To most Catholics, she actually really looked weak. She was a woman who could marry a Catholic prince, who um, may have been forced to change her will by the by Parliament who could die at any moment or even be usurped. And um, actually during the 1560s, so the first years of Elizabeth's reign, most Catholics were church papists, which confirmed, I mean, I was saying like, oh yeah, this is a policy that's going on. Fine, we'll, we'll go along with it. But, oh well, let's, let's just, eh, you know, let's just go along with it. Just don't cause any trouble and we'll be fine. It was really possible for Catholic recusants to follow their own private beliefs as long as they, I mean, if they were, as long as they did it privately, they could really do whatever they wanted. And it remained, this all remained until the Bull of Excommunication was issued, which didn't really increase the number of recusants, but it did increase the government's desire to find and punish them. So what are Elizabeth's attitudes towards Catholics? This, and I'm quoting from Elizabeth, I do not wish to make windows into the souls of men. What this essentially means is that she was tolerant towards Catholics. Um, this was supported by her settlement in 1559, which it did keep a few Catholic practices, which kind of annoyed um, her Puritan supporters. Um, she was tolerant of those who were obedient, and if she showed up to her church and you just kind of did, did the public thing, you could do literally whatever you want at home. Unlike Mary, who said you have to be Catholic a hundred percent of the time, um, she knew that Catholicism had always been strong in England, and she couldn't really upset any other foreign powers by just removing Catholicism because she had France and Spain to worry about, both of which were extremely Catholic countries. She knew that Catholics would remain loyal to to their religion and. Well, she did expend a lot of energy, um, basically rooting out Catholicism at a local level, rather than from the nobility, just from the normal people. Well, she also saw the removal of church imagery and statues from the church, as well as banning traditional Catholic ceremonies and pilgrimages, and enforcing the book prayer book that she had devised for her ministers, and she had approved. Then, well, she got excommunicated yet again. I mean, her father did, then Mary got recommunicated, then she got recommunicated. Excommunicated, sorry. 
but Pope Pius V issued the Bull of Excommunication in 1570, which prompted this huge fear in the government because it meant that um, Catholics could, could now say, because like, it was basically the Pope's way of saying, oh, he is not part of the Catholic Church, someone like do something about it. Um, so what she did, um, she released this act against bargaining in and executing papal bulls. It was illegal to have or preach the, the papal bull. What it really meant was that Catholics couldn't really say that it was a heretic, was illegitimate, was a tyrant, because if they did, well, she would be executed. They would be executed. So, you know, just shut up about it and like accept Elizabeth and her settlement and that's it. So now we have Presbyterians, Puritans, and Catholics. So let's like start. Um, first of all, uh, Pres Presbyterians. Well, these believe that the Church of England should be reformed even more. They they thought they wanted like they knew they wanted more. They wanted further reform. Just, uh, one of them, uh, one Presbyterian, was Cartwright, um, who spoke out against the role of the bishops in the church. He was a professor of divinity at Cambridge. And he thought that um, there was no really scriptural basis for the bishops in the church. Elizabeth really sacked him, but by doing this, she created a martyr. Um, there was also the publication of the two admonitions to Parliament, which were the first one was done in 1572, and it attacked the Book of Common Prayer and all its papist references because it did have some papist, some Catholic elements in it, even though it was. Was the Protestant, there was some Catholicism in there. Um, uh, the rights field in in Wilcox, who actually did uh, this this thing, they were imprisoned for a year. The second one was published by Goodman, and it put forward a Presbyterian system of the church. Then Whitgift developed this insulting tone, and I'm going to quote: um, "These admonitions are the very steps and degrees to Anabaptism." But in reality, Presbyterianism really was just a minority group. Uh, it was found really only in London, where the universities were. And Grindel, uh, he, he was appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury and was a Queen's man. And he wasn't as lax as Parker had become. So he, got, he, he also got suspended and then the whole movement started up again. So let's talk about Whitgift's articles and the attack on Presbyterianism. Well, first of all, we have the three articles. First one, clergy had to acknowledge um, royal supremacy. Second one, clergy had to agree that the prayer book and the ordinal contained nothing contrary to the word of God. What those documents say was what God wanted. And the third one meant that everything in the 39 articles were the word of God. Some really wanted to agree, but conditionally, because they didn't actually agree, but they just wanted to say they did if they could keep their jobs. Would give uh, one of this outright agreement. He had to agree unconditionally or, or nothing. He was forced, forced to back down and agree to a more uh, modified form of, of conformity. And really all he had to use was a prayer book. That's, that's it. He did have the support of the Queen, but her ministers were suspicious. Then is the decline of Presbyterianism. Well, by the late 1580s, really the Presbyterian movement um, had declined. The leader Field uh, died in 1589, and um, public opinion of the movement really suffered, especially after the Martin Marguerite chats in 1588. Uh, it was too outrageous and really humiliated the whole movement. It was against the Queen at the time when a country really needed to stick together because, if you know, well, 1588, that's the year of the Spanish Armada and the Catholics fled from Spain. So by the end, the movement declined and did reemerge, but in the 17th century under the Stuarts. Now we have the Puritans, and there's two types, the conformists and the separatists. So the conformists, one of them is, is Grindel. I mentioned him before. He was a queen's man. He was concerned with the um, upholding of her authority, and he regarded vestments as a diaphora. He was actually responsible for quashing the separatist movement in London in the 1570s, and was bishop and rose to replace Parker in 1575. He was really in good favor with the queen when it, uh, when it came to prophesying in London, which was a Protestant practice. 
Calvinists thought that this was the poor man's university because they could improve their preaching skills and do no harm. The queen, however, she saw it as a potential to preach Protestant ideals without really being controlled. So she preached extreme Protestantism. She ordered to get rid of it. He ordered um, Grindel to get rid of this, but he really refused. And she would imprison him, and he would go on to die uh, under arrest, not, not under execution, but under arrest in 1583. And the separatists, they just wanted a wholly separate church, just straight up a new one. Um, well, they, wanted, they essentially wanted the queen and the bishops and everyone who was present in the Church of England to have literally nothing to do with this new church. It was really too radical, however, and um, Brown was a really f the first leader, and he set up the Separatist Church in Norwich with Harrison. This petered out, and like he left for the Netherlands with some of the congregation, but he really came back um, when they, when him and well, when um, Harrison and Brown cut off. He like left, Brown left again to the Netherlands, I think, and he returned in late fifteen eighties with Barrow and Greenwood. The numbers were relatively small, but large enough to grant the passing of the Act of Seditious Secretary in 1593. He was tried, and, I mean, Brown was tried and executed for devising and circulating seditious books. And with them, separatism really died, but it came back under Charles I, but under a slightly different form. And that is the Puritans. And now we have Catholics, which is the, the last thing I'm going to talk about. First of all, we have Catholic missions. Well, in the early years of the reign, there, was, there wasn't really that much of a contest by the Catholic Church. Um, because if you were a Catholic Church, that, if you were a Catholic priest, sorry, you could be executed just by being a Catholic priest. Um, there was an English college at Douai, which was formed in 1569, and it focused on training priests to, to come to England and convert people back to the true religion. In 1575, 11 priests had come over, and by five years later, in 1580, 100 were there. But they didn't really have any infrastructure, so they had to stay and work from the houses of the Catholic gentry, which really couldn't convert anybody because those living in their homes were Catholic already, and they really had no means of safety. Then you have the, the Jesuits, who were really deadly and began arriving in England in 1568. You have the, the motto, you give me the boy and I'll give you the man. One notable Jesuit was Campion, who would go on to be found, tried, and executed in 1581. Then you have the penal laws against the, the Catholics. At the beginning, the settlement really was soft on Catholics. They, they, you could, as long as you didn't do anything outright, you would be fine. Uh, in 1571, uh, things started to heat up with um, the excommunication, and in 1571, uh, it was declared that um, bringing in the papal bulls was treasonable. I mentioned this earlier. 1581, it did become a treason to withdraw subjects' allegiance to the Queen or the Church of England. So if you withdraw your allegiance to the Queen, to the Church, you could be executed. In, well, in 1585, it was, it was treason to be a Catholic priest. 123 priests were actually tried and executed from 1586 to 1603 because, um, well, she, uh, I mean, she died, Elizabeth died in 1603. Then in 1587, uh, recusancy fine, fines were tightened. Um, I mean, an example is they had to pay 20 pounds a month if you, are, if you are found to be a recusant. And it kind of correlates with the fear of Catholic invasion. And the persecution of recusants was actually at its peak from 1588 to 1592. You consider that the very Pino of Scots threat was in 1587 and, and the Spanish Armada was in 1588. Well, you can kind of understand Elizabeth and her worry. And then you have the, the last big part, well, no, there's another part after this, but a huge part, which is the danger from internal Catholic rebellion. So not only outside, but those inside. Well, it was a Catholic rebellion in 1569, the Northern, Urge Northern Earls Rebellion, which was, it scared the, the government. Then the Throckmorton plot of 1583 really increased the fears, 
and the bond of association was um, passed, which was signed by the vast majority of people in Yorkshire and the gentry. Well, of that this would basically said was that if the queen were to suddenly die under suspicious circumstances, well, anyone who would benefit from her death would be killed, whether involved or not. So just let's not let the queen die, and then no one could die from that. And this was drafted by Walsingham and Cecil in 1584. So what are some of these Catholic plots? Um, well, you can't really ignore and talk about Catholic plots in England without talking about Mary Queen of Scots. Maybe she really became the focus of any, any plots against Elizabeth, and she was an heir, and she was a, a psychological threat. So, let's just get into them. First, we have the Ridolfi plot of 1571, which involved marrying Mary to Norfolk, and also kind of involved Spain. Philip really didn't want Mary on the throne because she was reckless and tart, and but Philip really didn't really get that involved. This plot got uncovered and Nor Norfolk was executed, but Mary managed to escape death. She wasn't present in England, but she escaped death. Then we had the Throckmorton plot of 1583, like I mentioned, which again involved Spain. As you can see, Philip uh, had quite a, an avid hatred for Elizabeth. Well, troops would uh, have to land in Sussex under the control of Mary's cousin. Walsingham um, uncovered the plot by torturing Throckmorton himself. And, well, the Spanish ambassador Mendoza was, was incriminated and expelled from the country. She couldn't really kill him because he was a Spanish, so he just let him, he ex she yeah, exiled him. Then we have the Parry plot of 1585. Uh, it, was this, it was a Welsh MP named Parry, and he confessed to this plot to assassinate the Queen with a, a and replaced her with Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. Um, it was meant to be, he was meant to be actually working for Cecil, so there's the question, was he set up or was he a double agent? Well, anyway, he was executed and this bond of association, which was written up in 1584, was sped up. And then we have the big one, the Babington plot of 1586. Well, it was intercepted by Walsingham before anything real happened, and it actually found legal evidence that would stand against her in a court of law. Um, double agents were entrapped, uh, they managed to entrap both Babington and Mary herself in a plot to kill the Queen. And Mary, she never really stated that she wanted to kill Elizabeth, but she did give, give supports to letters that suggested this, and gave support. This was tried in, in November 1586, and there was really no real political reason to keep Mary alive. Um, but Mary was Mary, not sorry, Elizabeth was reluctant to execute a fellow monarch because it feared it would set up a dangerous president for the English monarchy. And so then she was panicked into actually signing a death warrant, but had no intention of, of sending it. Her council, however, they found it, they sealed it, and um, they sent it in without Elizabeth knowing. So Mary was executed on the 8th of February, 1587, and ended up dying as a martyr. So, then what are the divisions in the Catholics? Well, the defeat of the Armada in 1588 caused Catholics to be pursued even further. Now, Spain was actually going to try to make England Catholic. Well, you know, she needed to make sure that England was 100% Protestant and then she had to worry about two things at once. So, at least on the home front, she could try to make England Protestant. So, maybe the Spanish wouldn't be as encouraged to invade. Well, authorities feared another armada would be sent, and so more and more anti-Catholic policies were pursued up until the majority of these Catholic nobles uh, died. The Queen didn't really want to make the recusants bankrupt, and the policy was really in the hands of local men. Um, they, they were less subtle in the hatred of the Catholics, and they really charged extremely heavy fines. Catholic landowners really found it like they were charged really um, expensive um, recusancy fines, but their enforcement was touchy, wasn't that, that strong. Of, of 800 uh, recusants in Lancashire, only, uh, only 11 paid fines. In Cheshire, only 16 recusants paid the full, uh, full like, fines of 260 per annum. 
But none of these families actually paid the fines were from the leading leading um, families, so leading Catholic families, so that wasn't that effective. And the Catholics were really divided in the archpriest um, controversy. Well, secular I mean, secular priests didn't really like the figure of this archpriest, and they didn't really like Blackwell, the man who was appointed to the role. Um, two secular priests actually appealed to Rome, and but actually stated that Rome came back saying that Blackwell had to stay, but wasn't allowed to con to consult Jesuits as he had Jesuit uh, favoring. So he feared that um, peer priests feared that the movement. Um, would be allowed to be dominated by Jesuits who weren't exactly liked. So yeah, that is religion and the second half of the Tudor period. I hope this helped and yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. Bye.